Oh, you want me to see? Now I feel like Oprah. <laughs> Maybe I've seen her so great stuff, and we connected maybe three years ago. I think I was overseas. Again, that happens a lot. And I had this woman on there go, "We need a photographer for a so great photo shoot." And I'm like, "My dentist will do that without even talking to him." And then I went, "Oh, is he gonna freak out a bit about that? Because he's very..." particular about what he does and when I told him what it was um, he immediately said yes without any hesitation um, because you know breast cancer is very very close to our heart and because my beautiful Kathy that was how she first knew that she had cancer when she found that lumps in her breast and I'm so passionate about what So Brave does, I tell everybody. And we've got, I know you all got a calendar in your welcome pack, but we will have more for sale. Um, so it's still got some. And, and I'm so pleased that we can, um, you know, be sponsoring So Brave and that it's the amazing work you do in your journey. And you know I so totally believe in, in it all and I can't wait for you to share some of that with these women and, and the absolute beauty and joy that So Brave is and I'm going to leave it to you. Thank you very much Liesl, don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> to us on Valentine's Day and one of my friends who's a publisher, I'll forget them, um, she said to me, did you mean to publish on Valentine's Day? And I said, oh, no, why? She said, oh, come on, the book title alone. And so you're one of very few people who've got this because we did like a super duper limited run like just so that we could come here with some. So yeah, and I just wanted, I will go into some gratitude in a minute, but I just wanted to a lot of respect to this woman and what she's created here in bringing us all together. I mean, I knew about this little exciting thing about a year ago and I was like a kid before Christmas. I couldn't wait and just, what are you going to tell everybody? What are you going to tell everybody? Come on, come on, come on. Um, so I can't wait till Friday too because yeah. we can tell everybody where we're all going next year, which is yeah. great. Well, so, you yes. know it's Vietnam. So well, you, 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 yes, that's right. That's right. Well done. Yes. yes, you can. Okay, but thank you very much. Lisa. And thank you all for coming. I know it's hot out there and there's lots of things to do on this beautiful island. I want to start just with a little quiet intention um, because we have been quite high and up and down on this last few days and I wanted to just reconnect in with that gratitude of why we're here. So if you can all just close your eyes just for a minute. Get yourselves comfy. I want to give thanks to all of these beautiful women who are here today. Thanks to Liesl for bringing us all together. I want you to just spend a few minutes just thinking about all of those people in your life, all the wonderful things that are happening for you. All those things that sometimes you think, oh yeah, I know I've got that. You've got that, that's amazing. I'm very thankful for my husband, very thankful for my family, thankful for living in Australia, I'm grateful for waking up every day, I'm thankful for being here right now. Okay, thank you ladies. So it would be not within my job description if I didn't start with a bit of a breast awareness message. So sorry to pike on about this, you've got breast awareness cards on each of your chairs. Um, wherever you are in the world, breast cancer is one of the highest rates of cancer for women. In Australia, it actually went from one in eight to one in seven women last year. So the incidence is actually increasing. So what my
my organization aims to do is to go into high schools, but also at events like this and women's events across the country in Australia. Um, so this is actually our first time overseas, which is really exciting. <laughs> young women and all women to be breast aware um, and we use this very easy to remember tool called smart women are breast aware and we'll go through that just really quickly so the s stands for statistics and significance so knowing what the risk is can help you make some decisions about your own treatment and your own personal um, advocacy for breast cancer if you've got a high family history then you have options in going and getting genetic testing and in knowing that there are not just older women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, but women in their 20s, 30s, 40s that get breast cancer can help you when you're going and advocating to a doctor to go and get something done about it. So when I'm in Australia talking to the girls, I'll say, there's 20,000 women going to get diagnosed with breast cancer this year, about 1,000 of those will be women aged in their 20s and 30s. It's about 5% of the overall but about 10% of all deaths. And oftentimes that's because it's found later, because young women think, ah, oh, it's not gonna to happen to me, and it's more aggressive. So knowing that, you can share that information with friends and family. The next one is manual, monthly, and mirror, the M. So this should be done every single month, and even if you're going to get your mammograms, which is another M, which you can start getting from 40, you should still be doing your monthly, manual, and in front of a mirror. So it doesn't need to be some big scary thing, just do it consistently so you know what is normal for you. So looking at the breast tissue, feeling the breast tissue can be in the shower, on the bed, in front of a mirror. Just notice anything that's different, skin puckering, changes to the area around your breasts, any lumps and bumps, anything that's unusual, skin texture changes, anything. Just go and see a GP, particularly if it's been there for more than four weeks, and we put this on our cards, ask them to get a scan. So again, an ultrasound if you're under 40, ask for a mammogram as well if you can. Uh, ask an awareness. So one of the biggest and most important things we do is to spread this word. Lots of young women, the very first time they ever do a breast exam is when they find the thing that leads to the diagnosis. And so telling your friends and family may just save their lives. Ask your friends, hey, when was the last time you did a breast exam? I won't ask, but I think the numbers of hands that would go up would be quite low. So make that awareness a priority for all of the women in your life, your sisters, your mums, your daughters, everyone. Next one's regular routine. There's a lot of stigma around breasts. You know, they've been typecast, stereotyped about what our inherent femininity is. And we need to remove that taboo. Knowing what is normal for you in your breast is very important for your life. And the last one is test, talk and trust. And we talk about knowing somebody in your life, a doctor in particular, that you can trust to ask, Hey, how do I do this breast exam? Can you show me? Can you do one for me? Ask for tests, you know, if there's something that you don't like. They might tell you, you're too young, you don't have any family history, don't worry about it. Ask for the test anyway. If they don't want to give it to you, see someone else. So it's all of that that comes together to become someone who's breast aware. And if you're breast aware, then you're more likely to find something different and do something about it. At the moment, early diagnosis is the best thing we've got, and the statistics and survival rates for that are really good. But once we get to stage four, which means it's gone from the breast to somewhere else in your body, then unfortunately we don't have any cure for that. Um, so that's the very, very brief breast awareness message. And now I'm going to share a little bit about my story. We're going to do a little bit about your story, and then I'm going to share some of the women I work with stories. So this week's, um, today's all about bravery, and I titled this Bravery Takes Resilience. I get so many women telling me, I'm not brave. I just did it because I had to. I had no choice. 100%. When I went to go and get my first chemotherapy, I didn't want to be there. I had a massive panic attack, but I went through it. I did it anyway. And I think that's bravery. Okay, so this is me. Normal. 
young, happy mother, wife, very educated. I just got my master's, got married, been with my husband, traveled, loving life. Just had a beautiful little baby boy. He was six weeks old when they finally found my diagnosis. And then we began treatment. So the top <coughs> left, which you can't really see for some reason because it's moved a little bit. Um, that was six weeks actually from when he was postpartum. So we were actually up in the hospital next door to where he'd been born. They brought a cot up into my room. My husband stayed in a little trundle because as soon as the anaesthetics had come out of my body, I was able to breastfeed him again. It was a very unusual situation for them. Most of the women they did breast surgery on were in their 50s and 60s, had none of these issues with breast milk coming out from all different places. And they didn't have to deal with babies on the ward. It was a very unusual situation. Uh, and then of course, because I'm young, I went through the whole gamut of everything. So I did an IVF cycle, which uh, was not exactly brilliant given that I'd just given birth. It didn't actually take, we didn't get anything to freeze in the end of it. But chemotherapy can actually shut your body down into, into menopause. So it was a bit of a safeguard that unfortunately didn't work for us. I went through chemotherapy, four rounds of dose dense, which is cytotoxic, lots of different things, your hair falls out. Um, the photo with my son in a little white outfit was actually uh, just before my third round and my hair was only holding in because I plaited it together and it was sticking into my head and I was like, I'm gonna look good for my christening photos. So that was, that was Henry's little christening. But of course it all fell out. Um, and I went through pretty traumatic experience. As you can imagine, you don't expect that when you've got a newborn at home. You're supposed to be home and enjoying that time with them, developing a bond. And so this really did turn our life quite upside down. I was on mat leave, which was beautiful. It meant that I didn't have to go back to work. I didn't have to worry about them, but they weren't great to me. And that sort of leads me into my story about what happened to me following all of my treatment. My treatment took, well, let's just say I'm not really finished treatment. So my active treatment with chemotherapy finished up in May, almost 18 months after I was diagnosed because I had to have two different courses, one of which sent me into an anaphylactic reaction when I almost died. I had radiotherapy, immunotherapy, and I'm on hormone therapy, an injection, and a daily tablet. And I'll be on that for another five years, and I'm a six-year survivor. So the reason I say that is that... Thank you. Clap, clap. Sometimes when you've got friends in your life that have gone through breast cancer, you think, oh, she's done her treatment now, she's fine. And unfortunately, it doesn't just end when you leave the chemotherapy ward or the radiation ward. You actually have these follow-ups for years and years and years and years, and you'll be taking something for years and years and years and years. So there's this long period of being with the disease, even if you don't want to. So that, that's been continuing. But I felt robbed. I felt like this was not supposed to happen to me. I was in my job that I wanted to be in. I was in the career I wanted to be in. I had just gotten in there and had my baby. I was excited about getting back to work and it all just went to poo. So I decided to get active because when you're sitting around doing pretty much nothing except for going to appointments all the time, you think, well, how can I make a difference? How can I make a change? And so my sister, who's six years younger than me, uh, said, hey, Michelle, let's get fit this year. And I'm like, Sarah, I've like literally just gone through chemo. I'm like, I'm not doing what you're suggesting. We walked 60 kilometers around Brisbane over a weekend to raise money to fight women's cancers. And that's my kit, so I put the top right there, which is coming in. And my friend, uh, Helen and I, um, at the end there, um, we've done women's fun runs and walks, and the bottom picture is actually the Premier of Queensland and I, so that we were, you know, supporting all of the women who were going through that, um, because there are so many amazing organisations out there. But what I found was there wasn't anything specific for young women, 
So while there was, and there are great organisations, National Breast Cancer Foundation in Australia does amazing things in research. They spend $12 million a year to fund research across the country. We've got Breast Cancer Network Australia, which does amazing advocacy. If, if they didn't exist, I wouldn't be here right now because they were the ones that put Perceptin on the PBS, which is our pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical benefit scheme, which means that we can get the drugs without having to pay tens of thousands of dollars each injection. And they continue to do that advocacy work for all women. Um, and Cancer Australia, Cancer Council, there's lots of amazing ones, but it was nothing specific for young women. Um, and I felt really isolated. I would turn up to support group meetings and I'd be the youngest one there by 20 or 30 years. I'd be talking about, you know, my newborn and kids at daycare and, oh my God, this is a whole big life change, to grandmothers and to women talking about accessing their superannuation, which I couldn't because I wasn't in terminal stage cancer. So it was a very different space and a lot of different things that I had to deal with that other women didn't have to. So, the catalyst was my work at the end of my mat leave telling me, if you don't come back in, here's your two weeks notice. And I said, but I'm still going through treatment, can't really come back in, here's your two weeks notice. So I was pretty annoyed with that and decided, okay, this is a good sign. This is time for me to do something different and what am I going to do with my life? So I went to my very first business conference and some of the ladies here have been and I've met them through that conference. And I met a lady who sat down next to me at a conference dinner and said, hey, I'm a body pain artist. And I went, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know, before the next conference, maybe I can paint you. And I went, hmm, okay, I'll think about that. Um, I wasn't approved, but I certainly wasn't somebody to do something so vulnerable. You're basically down to your underpants and the whole body is covered in paint. Anyway, so I went to, again, retreats change lives. I went to a breast cancer retreat the week after that with my family. And I was reading through the book there and reading these terrible stories of woe. And woke up one morning and this light bulb. I'm going to do this. What do you think? I said to my husband about me going back to that woman and telling her, what if we got a whole bunch of young women together and did this body painting thing? And wouldn't that be so empowering? They've just lost their breasts, they've lost their hair, they've lost their femininity. Some of them had to have hysterectomies, oophorectomies. They've put weight on, they've lost weight, they've gone through relationships, they've done a whole range of things that have set them into menopause and changed their lives. So you think that'd be amazing? Thankfully, my good friend Wendy said, yeah, let's do it. So we started on this track just wanting to make a difference and wanting to basically raise some money for research so that we can change the thing for the next woman. But it kind of morphed and saw me becoming the voice of this mas massive national organization and uh, being in Cosmopolitan and all these national newspapers and local newspapers and most recently on a feature show on Channel 7. So all of those things started to sort of steamroll and snowball. Um, I was invited to speak as the signature speaker for the McGrath Foundations because they wanted to know more about what young women and how they're having those conversations with their daughters. Do you want to say what the McGrath Foundation so is? So McGrath Foundation Australia know. is uh, an amazing organisation uh, started by um, two friends. Um, Tracy Bevan and um, Jane McGrath, they're both um, wags of cricket, cricketing um, people. Cricket, for those people who don't know, is the... <laughs> um, and they were really good friends and um, Tracy had um, been told by her best friend that she found this lump and they did something about it. And unfortunately, she went to stage four and they had this amazing experience with the breast care nurse and so they wanted that experience for all women who go through breast cancer to have somebody there to walk them with that path. And so now there's about 180 breast care nurses around Australia funded by the McGrath Foundation and there's lots of private ones across the country as well. They're amazing. They're the people that you talk to about all the stuff you can't tell anybody else. They have all this information that can be really helpful. So. We've done a lot of work with McGrath as well, especially in our second year when we went to regional Australia. And if I thought I had a bad 
the city, the region, tell it, tends up to us. So, we're doing all these things, getting recognised, winning awards, doing things, making an impact. To date, we've funded $115,000 worth of research. We've also... We've gone into schools, as you can see down the bottom there, that's with one of the private schools in Brisbane. We're trying to expand that program now to get it out to all the different schools. So meetings with ministers, so just this last couple of weeks, meeting with Queensland and Northern Territory Health Ministers to try and get out to all of the schools and educate young women. Um, and make an impact also on young women. And my dear friend Sarah is here today. And um, I wasn't going to mention it actually, but I do have her photo up here. So. Um, you know, unfortunately, the reality of breast cancer is that not everybody makes it to the end. And two of our lovely ladies in that same calendar aren't with us anymore. Uh, one of them has, happens to be one of Sarah's best friends, Ria. And another lo lovely, lovely human, Nari, who unfortunately didn't even get to see her calendar printed because she passed away two months beforehand. And unfortunately, that's the reality a lot of people don't see. They see young women not being able to get this disease. They see young women being risk, uh, low risk. In fact, now I'm actually going to all of these health ministers and telling them that they need to reword some of their um, health material because <coughs> it's just not right. It's not a low risk for young women. In fact, it's the highest and most commonly diagnosed breast cancer in women aged 20 to 39 in Australia and it's very common in other countries, including the US. Okay, so we've been doing all this thing. We've painted 48 young women across the country, and we're working into our next fifth calendar now. So that's a little bit about my story and where I've come, and now I'm looking towards the future because I'm trying not to focus on that shitty time in my past. And certainly with the organization, we deal with some women with some significant trauma. You know, they've lost a lot where they come to when we meet them. But I'm trying to change that for the better. And so, you know, my husband and I, 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 I'm so blessed. The fact that I'm very, even here today, is a blessing. I got to see my kids go to school. We get to take family holidays overseas. Um, I got to see my brother get married, finally, after 10 years dating the same girl. <laughs> uh, I got to do with. Camino with my, my husband, two of our good friends, and a girlfriend from high school. And as a Friday, we published a book. So, you know, little things that you can do to try and change the thing for the next one. And I know that this book will have huge ripples because it's 15 women's stories. Um, written to somebody who's about to go through their own journey and learning from all those women's journeys. So what I wanted you to do, and I don't know if you've all got pen and paper, but I wanted you to spend just a few minutes, maybe five, ten, we'll see how we go for time, and to write a letter. Um, I can't change the screen yet because I think it'll trigger the music. But I want you to think about a time in your life when you've had one of the Ds. Patria King talks about this. A divorce, depression, a diagnosis, a death, depression, a redundancy, one of those Ds. And I want you to write a letter to somebody who's at day one of where you were and tell them what you would want to know. So I'm just going to spend a little time thinking about that. Oh. 